Hello and welcome to Physics Line with Haseeb Hadid. Today we will discuss a relatively new topic that has been added recently into CAIE O-Level Physics and this is star formation. This belongs to a section which is called space physics. So let's get started. Before we get into the details of the life cycle of a star, we need to know the source of power of a star because it plays a very important role in making a star stable. So what happens in a star is that it has a core in which there are hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms fuse together to form heavier helium nucleus. And during this process, huge amount of thermal energy is released. And we call this reaction as a fusion reaction. And you should know a rule of thumb. The stability means less energy. Since during fusion reaction, thermal energy is being emitted out of the system, so the system itself is becoming more stable. So this, in this process of achieving stability, thermal energy is released, which actually powers a star. And this thermal energy is actually emitted in the form of electromagnetic radiations. And we also know that electromagnetic radiations have a spectrum that starts off with radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible region, ultraviolet, x-rays and finally we have gamma rays. You should remember this uh, spectrum with the help of a mnemonic which we say as Raging Martians invaded Venus using X-ray guns. You should know that only this region of electromagnetic radiations is visible. Why do we see a star glowing in the night sky? Because in that star, nuclear fusion is occurring and that nuclear fusion is emitting electromagnetic radiations if those electromagnetic radiations being emitted by the star lie in the visible region, you will be able to visualize the emission of energy. So now you know why do the stars glow? Because they are being powered by nuclear fusion and that nuclear fusion is emitting electromagnetic radiations that lie in the visible region. So just to briefly describe whatever I have told you as yet, nuclear fusion occurs in the core of a star Smaller hydrogen nuclei fuse together to form a heavier helium nucleus which is more stable. This process causes emission of some neutrons and thermal energy. This thermal energy is the source of uh, power for a star. Now let's get started with the life cycle of a star. It all starts with a molecular cloud. And a molecular cloud is nothing but a cloud of dust and gas. We know that most of the space is basically vacuum. But you, you find some pockets in the space where gas and dust particles are present which make up a cloud. In that molecular cloud we have dust particles. Newton tells us that every object that has mass has a gravitational field around it. And in that gravitational field what it does, it, it, uh, it applies a force of attraction on other objects. So because of the force of attraction, the dust particles start moving towards each other. It means they gain kinetic energy and when uh, they are moving towards each other they ultimately collide. Now their kinetic energy gets converted into thermal energy. With time it keeps on attracting more and more particles from around and keeps getting bigger in size. Newton also tells us that if the mass of the object is greater it will apply even greater force of gravity on other objects. So since the size is getting bigger and bigger of that cloud, the force of gravity starts taking its, its effect and ultimately this cloud contracts under, gra under gravity and starts swirling. At this stage we say that a protostar has been formed. So it all started with a molecular cloud which has been converted into a protostar which is a swirling cloud of gas that has been contracted under gravity. Okay, this protostar is very unstable. Why? Because the force of gravity would keep 
on shrinking this protostar further and further. So how does it achieve stability? You need to get back to uh, what I told you about the source of power of a star. Because of the collisions, thermal energy is produced and that thermal energy initiates nuclear fusion reaction. Let me tell you one more thing about nuclear fusion. It cannot occur at normal temperature. It requires, you, uh, it requires higher temperatures to fuse smaller nuclei into each other. Not just high temperature, but high pressure is also required. From where do we get higher pressure? Due to the force of gravity, which is actually pulling the particles together. So this protostar is a very unstable stage because force of attraction is greater and it keeps on shrinking the cloud uh, shorter and shorter. But due to the collisions, another thing is happening. Thermal energy is being produced, which ultimately initiates nuclear fusion reaction, which produces even more thermal energy. And that thermal energy is called as thermal radiation. This thermal radiation creates a force against gravity. You see those blue uh, arrows which are, which are trying to pull the protostar in and you see those red arrows which indicate the, the pressure that is generated by thermal radiations. So this outward pressure comes into play and starts to balance the pressure that has been created due to force of gravity. At one stage, this outward pressure due to thermal radiations becomes so big that it starts balancing the inward pressure due to gravity. And at this stage, we say that the star has achieved a stable state. And we call this stage as main sequence star. This slide contains very important information that might be asked in, uh, in, in exams. Number one, what is thermal radiation? What is thermal pressure? Number two, how a star becomes stable. It becomes stable when the thermal pressure becomes equal to the gravitational pressure. So until now we have learned about the molecular cloud which turns into a protostar and when the inward pressure becomes equal to the output pressure we call that stage as main sequence star. So what happens afterwards heavily depends on this stage. That what was the size of the protostar? If during this stage it accumulated huge amount of uh, dust particles into a ball then it will take a different course after main sequence stage. But if it was unable to attract many particles to be called really massive, then it will take a different path. So if the star has a size that is greater than eight times of the sun, then the star will transform into a red supergiant. But if it was unable to accumulate uh, more dust particle during the protostar stage, it will become a red giant because its size will be less than or equal to eight times of what our sun's size is. Today in this lesson, we'll discuss about this path onwards. What happens after uh, the main sequence star if the, that main sequence star was the size of the sun or maximum eight times of what our sun is. We'll discuss red supergiant stage in the other video. So I told you that main source of power for a star is the nuclear fusion reaction. And during nuclear fusion reaction, smaller hydrogen nuclei are being fused into helium nuclei. You should know one thing, that if I want to fuse smaller nuclei together, I need some some energy. I need to give it some energy. I need to input some energy in to cause this fusion or to make this fusion happen. Now consider that I want to go further and I now want to fuse helium nuclei together to form even heavier nuclei. 
So if I compare the amount of input energy that I require for the fusion of hydrogen nuclei with the amount of energy that is required for the fusion of helium nuclei, this input energy will be much greater. If I require greater energy for this thing to happen, then I need greater gravitational force. If I need a greater gravitational force, I need greater mass because that inward pressure is being generated due to the mass of the object, due to the mass of the star. If it is greater, the force of gravity that is pulling the ball inward will be greater. So if that amount of gravitational force is not available, then I will not be able to fuse helium nuclei together because fusing heavier nuclei together requires much more energy than what is required for the fusion of smaller nuclei. So what will happen with time is that hydrogen atoms will be consumed and most of them would have been fused into helium nuclei. So at this stage, we have deficiency of the fuel which is hydrogen nuclei so if the fuel gets less guess what the outward pressure that is being generated because of this fusion reaction would also reduce if that outward pressure reduces the inward pressure will start taking its effect and when this, when this inward pressure start taking its effect, it causes the star to shrink. The star is not stable anymore. It has gone further from its main sequence stage and is now on its path to become a red giant. So because helium nuclei are heavier than hydrogen nuclei, we need greater energy and pressure for the fusion to occur and make heavier element like carbon, etc., which is not available in a smaller star because it has less force of gravity and that's le that less force of gravity will not provide enough pressure to fuse the helium nuclei together. Ultimately, what happens is the radiation pressure drops and gravitational pressure starts taking its effect, which causes the star to shrink under gravity. It also produces thermal energy during this process, which radiates outwards to the outer core. And at this stage, we say that a star has become a red giant. This is the definition of a red giant. When radiation pressure falls due to slower fusion, the star shrinks and radiates thermal energy outwards. This expanded unstable star is called a red giant. Moving on further, the red giant will transform into a white dwarf. How will it transform into a white dwarf is interesting. You know that the main nuclear reaction is occurring at the core of the star where fusion of hydrogen nuclei is occurring. And because of that fusion reaction, thermal energy is being produced. Now since that red giant, now since the red giant stage is deficient of uh, hydrogen nuclei so we have less fuel available so when we have less fuel available no more thermal energy will be generated rather the residual thermal energy of the core will keep on moving outward and when that residual thermal energy keeps on moving outwards it causes the outer core the outer core to explode and when that outer core, core explodes we are left with the inner core, which is white hot. Be why is it white? Because it is still having the residual energy, which is being emitted in the form of visible light. This white dwarf, after emitting all of its residual energy, gets converted into a black dwarf. Now this black dwarf has huge mass because you have shrinked the dust particles together and they are so close together that the density of the ball has become bigger. So when uh, the gravitational force starts taking its effect again because of the heavier mass of the ball, 
it further shrinks. And this shrinked form is now called a planetary nebula. So just to give you an overview of the life cycle of a smaller star, it all starts off with a molecular cloud which gets transformed into a protostar. That protostar then further moves on to become a main sequence star when the gravitational pressure and, inward, and the outward radiation pressure becomes equal. Because of the deficiency of hydrogen fuel, the main sequence star gets converted into a red giant, which is an expanded, cooler and unstable star due to slower fusion. That red giant then gets rid of its outer core to become a white dwarf. And then that white dwarf gets converted into a black dwarf after emitting all of its radi residual thermal energy. And due to force of gravity, uh, that black dwarf further shrinks into a planetary nebula. Thank you. That was all from my side in this video. I'll get back to you with another video about the life cycle of a bigger star. Stay tuned.